Do you guys listen to music? Does everybody in here listen to music? Does it have an impact on you? Throw out some things that music does for you. Makes you happy. Gives you peace. Motivates you. Makes you cry. Gives you hope. Makes you calm. So when you are worshiping to your favorite songs, it brings out and evokes an emotion in you, right? Perhaps when you're exercising, I know the song that I would work out to and it would make me work out harder is the Eye of the Tiger. Like, I'm in terrible shape, but if I play the Eye of the Tiger, I'm going to work out harder than I did before I played the Eye of the Tiger. I don't, I don't know, I, I envision myself dancing, you know, like Rocky, and I'm, I'm going to probably throw up after that, but the point was, a, the point was accomplished, right? It, it motivated me to do something. Just the beat of the song makes you start dancing. You start going like, man, whoever wrote this song, this is... It's a powerful song, right? It has nothing to do with Jesus, but you see how music, at, at weddings and funerals, people have special songs they play, right? They have a, a song that means something to maybe a dad and a daughter or a mom and a, and a son. I know at funerals, I recommend the family picks three to four songs that when the funeral's over and years have gone by, when that song goes on, it brings, it brings a memory back to them. It brings a memory. All this to say that like today... We are going to hear a joyful song. Today, you're going to hear how you cannot possibly not help but sing when you hear God's plan of salvation. We are in this Advent and Christmas season. Advent just means coming. So it's the coming of this nativity scene was the original Advent. And then we have this second coming of Christ. And so we are in this season leading up to the coming of our Savior. And we're going to follow along in the first chapter of Luke as Luke gives us this account of Elizabeth and Zechariah and how Zechariah responded instantly to his part in God's plan with this expression of praise and worship. And so what I'm going to do is really work my way through a whole bunch of scripture. We're going to start in verse 5 of chapter 1. And I'm going to do a lot of narrating, not reading line by line of the scriptures, but kind of retelling you the story. But before I get into that, our, our main text is going to be from Luke 1, 67 through 79. And this is known as the Benedictus, which means praise be. And it's recorded as this song of thanksgiving uttered by Zechariah on the occasion of the circumcision of his son John the Baptist. And so the, the, the verse 67 opens up with, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel. Or a different rendering could say, Praise be the Lord God of Israel. And so all of this is to say that when, when Zechariah's mouth was loosed and he was able to speak, the first thing he did was praise God. He didn't complain. He didn't talk to his family. He praised God. And over the centuries of the church, this has turned into what scholars would say is a joyful song and one of the first Christmas songs in the New Testament. So imagine if we lived without a message from God. No Bible, no preaching, only silence from above. Because the Christian, can, you, can, you, can, you can agree with me, right, that like, the, the Holy Spirit's interacting with you. God's talking to you. He's probably not talking audibly, but He's talking to your spirit, right? You, you, you hear from God in His, His Word. God confirms things to you as you're going through your life, right? You, you agree with that, right? So imagine during the, 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 middle, the, the middle of the Old Testament and New Testament is this intertestamental period, which is called the silent years which lasted 400 years. So the end of Malachi to the beginning of your New Testament, scholars say is a 400-year period where there was silence. Nobody heard from God. And you had kind of different people groups that looked like today. You had people who were holding on to hope, which you're going to see Zechariah and Elizabeth holding on to hope. Others were stuck in ritual and routine. You had the, the Pharisees and the religious leaders. So others were not even thinking about God and his promises anymore. And then you had King Herod who had built idols. Immorality was rampant. So coming out of this silent season in our Bible, you had 
basically what looks like today. You have people still holding on to hope. You have people who are uh, self-righteous and legalistic. You had people who have given up and aren't following God at all. And you have a very immoral environment and you guys don't have to drive too far in Decatur to see a gambling place or a place of ill repute or a place where uh, just negative things is happening. And that's similar to how our culture is today. And so follow along with me. So there's a priest named Zechariah and he had a wife. Her name was Elizabeth. And they lived during this time of what would be called the silent period, this deep darkness and despair. And so they had this silence from God, but Luke tells us they also had this silence in their life from no children. And in the time period of when they lived, to not have children meant that people thought you were cursed. They thought there was something wrong with you. And so you had this priest who was devoutly following God, who had this heartbroken situation in their life. They were well beyond the age of having children. And so they thought that uh, this season of their life was something that would never happen. And everybody around them thought they were cursed for some reason. But yet, despite this silence and despair, Luke 1, 6 tells us they were both found righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all of his ways. And so I don't know about you, but if I'm uh, struggling and there's doomy clouds overhead and it's one of those rainy days in my life, it's not easy to be found blameless and righteous, right? It's not easy to be found continuing to follow God, taking steps forward regardless of the situations around you. And so I have a little application for you here early on. Perhaps you're here today and heaven is silent for you. You've been talking to God and you feel like He's not listening. I have a friend, he's not here today, and he said, when I pray, nothing happens. When I pray, nothing happens. When I pray, nothing happens. And I said, buddy, I know, I know God loves you still. Like, why don't you hear anything? If I had the answer to that, I wouldn't be here in Decatur at this little church. <laughs> but I know that God loves you and I know that He hears your prayers and... Uh, Keep faithfully marching on. Keep faithfully taking steps closer to Christ. You see, Zechariah was a priest. There was about 20,000 priests in this time period. He was one of them. Every direct male descendant of Aaron was a priest. And two weeks out of the year, when his division was on duty, uh, Zechariah would travel to Jerusalem for his temple responsibilities. This time, he was chosen by Lot, Luke 1.9 tells us, to be the one to enter into the holy place and burn incense outside the curtain to the holy of holies. And this was a prestigious opportunity, but it was also a humbling opportunity because in your Old Testament, there were priests that went in that weren't right, and they basically were incinerated. They were evaporated. They were destroyed in the presence of God, because God doesn't allow sin in His presence. And so to be selected to go in to burn the incense was a reverential uh, and, and, and good thing, but also, I think, uh, you know, making sure you had your life lined up and that you were ready to do the job that God had for you. So Zechariah arranges the incense, the Scriptures tells us, and offers prayer of intercession for the people. And while he's doing that, a multitude of people are outside praying as well. That's Luke 1.10. They're, they're waiting for him to come back out and pronounce this Arianic blessing, which, which is from number 6, which the priest would have came out and said, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face to shine upon you. The Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you His... Peace. And so he was inside doing that. The people were outside praying. And guess what happened? He didn't come out. There was this delay, the Scriptures tell us. And Zechariah was delayed. And as Zechariah is on the inside, he has this smoke burning from the incense. Uh, think of it this way. His, his eyes were a, a little shielded and he thought he saw something in the room. This wasn't a public room. Nobody else could go in. This was reserved for the priest. This was reserved for the, the righteous people. And he's, uh, he's in this room. Incense smoke's burning. He thinks he sees something. The next thing you know, he's face to face with angel Gabriel. Luke 11 and 12 tells us. The text says, fear fell upon him. Another rendering might say, fear gripped him. Have you ever been in a situation where like, 
you know, you've seen one of those scary movies where like the person's trapped and they're done. And they're like, fear has gripped their life, right? And that's, that's the description of like, he was afraid. Zechariah was afraid because there was not supposed to be anybody else in this holy place with him. And then on the right side of the altar, which was considered to be the side of favor, the angel Gabriel appears. His initial message, and this is how most of the angels rolled with the people, do not be afraid, is what you hear a lot of the, the, the interactions with because the people were terribly afraid. So whatever these angels look like, it scared the humans. And then, Your prayer has been answered. So Gabriel rolls on the scene, scares the death out of Zechariah, and says, do not be afraid. Your prayers have been answered. And so you would think, we're going to have a son. Celebration takes place, right? Verses 14 and 15 explain what kind of man that this uh, son of Zechariah would turn out to be. Verses 16 and 17 describe the message that he would go about preaching. And among the jobs he would have, it would be to bring the people back to the Lord and turn the hearts of the fathers to their children. Which, interestingly and beautifully, Malachi is the last book in your Old Testament. Malachi ends with how Luke begins. This Elijah that Malachi talks about, we're told, is this Elijah uh, in spirit, John the Baptist, who is coming on to the scene. If you go to Malachi 4, 5, turn the hearts of their fathers to their children is the exact description you're getting from verses 16 and 17 here where it says, and he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God and he will be He will go before him in the spirit of Elijah and turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord a a people prepared. So when Gabriel tells him that he's going to be a father, Zechariah doesn't just go, hey, thank you. That's awesome. Like, I'm super excited. Like, we're really old, but now we're we're going to have a, a son, right? He doesn't say that. He said, well, How do I know that this is going to happen? He immediately, he wants a a sign. He says, how can I be sure of this in verse 18? I am an old man and my wife is well along in years. So what he was really saying is, I can't believe what you're telling me. And so uh, the scriptures say that Gabriel matched this empathetic expression with, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God and I was sent to speak to you and bring you good news. Who are you to tell me what I'm telling you? And on one hand, Zachariah's question seems valid, right? Like, the guy's old. Like, we don't really know how old, but like, I'm going to think he's well beyond the years of having children. We're talking like, you know, 60, 70, 80 years old, going like, how in the world are we going to have a child? But on the other hand, this man who's found righteous and blameless in God's sight and is a priest, he should have known better, right? Right? He was too busy asking questions and focusing on problems to really hear from God. He was too busy asking questions instead of focusing. He was too busy worrying about the problem of how in the world are we going to have a child beyond childbearing years to focus on God. little application for you. How many of you are too busy asking questions and focusing on problems to hear from God. I'm just as guilty. I, I focus on how is this going to happen. Well, this is what one of my, my, one of my mentors, he says, who builds the church? Jesus builds his church. So my job is to faithfully preach the word and love the people. Jesus builds the church. And so I should have no pressure, nor should I ever be sitting around talking about how I build this church. Right? My job is to preach the word and love the people. Interestingly, Zechariah had asked for a sign. He gets one. Because when he says he doesn't really understand how this is going to work out, this is what uh, uh, Gabriel says to him, and now you will be silent and not be able to speak until the day this happens, because you do not believe my words, which will come true at their proper time. So he asked for a sign. He ended up spending nine months sign languaging (laughs) signs to people. Isn't that, it's interesting, right? You know, you could say a little sense of humor, but I wonder, um, I wonder if if we lived in this, 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 
this time where we had uh, we couldn't talk. What would we learn? Where we had to go through this, you know, I have to sign language in order to get people to understand me. And we have this Christmas season that's upon us. We have all these things competing for our attention. All these things competing for our resources. And I want to give you some application, Christian. You've got to tune out the world. You've got to, I think you've got to completely tune out the news media. I don't know any of the news. I don't know any of the stuff going on. My life's better for it, to be honest with you. And I'm not dumb and ignorant. Uh, I read stuff. I don't listen to things. I, or I don't watch things. I, I read things and I listen to a little bit of stuff. But we've got to tune out all this white noise, right? All this stuff telling us what you know, Christmas is about, the, the guy in the red suit, and Christmas is about buying all these things. And you need all this stuff, right? Which you all have lived long enough to know that Black Friday sales are all junk in the first place, right? They got that new store, Five, five and Below, or they, now we call, we call the dollar store Tree Fitty because it's no longer a dollar. <laughs> and you go in there, and a lot of it's like garbage, right? But yet, we feel the need to buy all these things because stuff's in front of us all the time. And yet, an application point from Zachariah's life is tuning out all of the improper music and turning into the proper music of God. And allowing God to speak through the silence of our life as we listen to Him. So I want to pick up in the story in Luke 1, 57. So Aldo's going to preach the, the story of Mary. I'm preaching the story of Elizabeth and Zechariah. And so this is kind of the first half of the story. And then we pick up in verse 157. About nine months later, there's a baby born. Eight days after the, the baby's born, the whole town comes out to the circumcision ceremony because it's the baby's big day. He's going to enter into the covenant community. He's supposed to get the name of his father. Everybody's expecting the, the family to come out and say, here's Zechariah Jr. here. And the wife comes out and she insists on naming him John. Everybody in the community, the scriptures say, uh, in 59 and 60 is really confused because this isn't how we do stuff. And everybody looks to Zechariah because the people are all worked up. This firstborn son, he should be named Zech Jr. Zechariah, he does the sign language thing and he says, can I get a tablet? And he writes down, his name is to be John. And then immediately the scriptures say in 164, his mouth was open, his tongue was loose, and he spoke blessing God. You see, these verses provided in 67 through 79, are this prophetic answer to verse 66. So the people in 66 said, And all who heard them laid them up in their hearts, saying, What then will this child be? For the hand of the Lord was with him. And so you have this, what's described, Luke uses the word, this, this, this Holy Spirit prophecy. And I want to define that for you so you have some, some bumper guards to operate in. And in the Bible... You have to let Scripture interpret Scripture. And in, in the Bible, prophecy has a double-sided approach to it. There's foretelling, which is future. It's about revealing God's will for the future. And I think there is some future prophecy in 67 through 79. But there's also foretelling, which is about proclaiming God's word that's already revealed. And so you both have foretelling and foretelling. So when you read what you think is prophecy in the Bible, you have to place it in the category of foretelling, which is a future event, or foretelling, which is something that God's already said, and we're just redeclaring it. And oftentimes, most people are just redeclaring what God's already said, right? And so you have to kind of run with these guardrails. And so let's just jump in. We're going to read right through verse 67 through 79. And his father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. And as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our father Abraham, him to grant us that we being delivered from the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness 
Before him all our days. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people and the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high, to give the light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet in the way. Of peace. And so just to quickly recap, this is Zechariah and Elizabeth. They, they don't have a child. Zechariah is in the, in the holy place burning incense. He has this encounter with angel Gabriel where basically God sent Gabriel to be a messenger to tell him his prayers had been answered. Zechariah questions the angel. The angel uh, basically tells Zechariah, you're not going to be able to talk for the next nine months. And then we pick back up in the story where the child is born eight days later. They're supposed to come in front of the people, the circumcising, give him his name. Everybody's kind of shocked because uh, his name's not going to be Zechariah Jr. because he was told what the child's name was going to be. It was John. And so the family kind of shocks everybody. Everybody is sitting back kind of going like, what, what is going on here? Like, this is not like how any of this is supposed to work. But the people were, were talking about all of these things because this was like a story to be told. And then the moment that Zechariah's tongue is loosed, what he says is verses 68 through 79. And so you see, Zechariah views the present events concerning John and Jesus through the lens of God's faithfulness. So the, the Jews would have known all of these promises that the Old Testament would have held. And so you're seeing the, the New Testament being literally written. You're in Luke chapter 1. It's the beginning of this New Testament story. And, and Zechariah would have known the births of these two babies are part of the story of a God who keeps his promises. The first words he says are not directed to his wife or his family. They are in praising God. And I can tell you, the first words that I ever say, usually they're not in praising of God. It's uh, wanting to talk to another person to get the satisfaction of uh, talking about something with another person, right? Here's some application for you. This is a perfect example of how God's discipline does not qualify us. So, so Zechariah was, was disciplined for his disbelief. His time of silence, though, was not judgment. It was mercy, Filled with the Holy Spirit, Zechariah breaks out in a prophetic praise. Zechariah is blessing God for blessing him. And I've got a couple points that I want to nail down for you. Here's my first point. Christ coming provides salvation. Christ coming provides salvation. So in verse 68, you see this word visited or come. And it says, uh, blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people. This word visited or come in your Bible might say originates from this root word to visit personally and was used by Jesus in Matthew 25, 36, when he said, I was sick and you visited me. So this word has this root in this idea of, of a person who is in trouble and you're going to go personally intervene to help them. Have you guys ever done that? Someone's in trouble. And you go intervene to help him. And so what, what Zechariah is saying here is, blessed be the Lord God of Israel. Praise the God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people. They were in trouble. They had many problems. And Zechariah is saying that God has personally come here to redeem us. He's personally come here to visit with us. And as Zechariah looks down at his baby boy, he knows that the help is on the way. Somehow he knows that his son will help prepare the way. He doesn't really, I think, know what that's going to look like. But you see this redemption word. It says, and redeemed his people. Redemption, it has a meaning to redeem, is to release from bondage to the payment of a price. And so Zechariah knew that the Savior was here and he was coming and that he was going to redeem the people through a price that had to be paid. Verse 69, it says, He has raised up a horn of salvation for us. You see, this horn is not a musical instrument. It's actually a deadly weapon that goes on the top of an animal. It is a symbol both of strength 
and victory as the animal strength was concentrated in the horn. You guys have seen this type of thing on the National Geographic channel, right? Where the, the bull with the horns uses it to protect himself or to protect the, those around him. And this horn is a reference to Jesus Christ, the most powerful deliverer. Verses 71 through 74 use this word, saved or rescued. He saved or rescued us from the hand of our enemies to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins. What Zechariah is telling us here is that Jesus did not visit the planet simply to see how we're doing. Jesus came here because we were in trouble. We were living in a lost, sinful state. He came here to save us. And so what is Christmas all about? It's the acknowledgement that we are lost and that we need to be saved and that this salvation plan that God's laid out from the very beginning back to Genesis 3.15, a Savior will be coming is, this, is what we celebrate Christmas for. It's this idea that salvation has arrived and that's what we celebrate Christmas for. Point number two, Christ's coming fulfills prophecy. As a godly Jew, Zechariah can't get over the fact that God has kept His promise. 400 years of silence. We have all of this mess going on in our culture today. I can tell you, I can relate this big, huge mess. The mess in our government. The mess in our, in our country. The mess in our world. And how is God going to work all this out? And then imagine us sitting here and you see something like happen in like real time. God Delivered. God came through. God did what He said He was going to do. He is faithful. So I'm here to tell you today, if you're struggling with, is God going to hear me? Is God going to answer? Is God going to deliver? Absolutely. If you follow the Lord for any length of time at all, you already know He don't do it in your time. He does it in His time, which I found takes you to the end of yourself, right? to where you then have to rely on faith, on faith that God is going to show up. And so you have a unique situation in your life. Well, friend, I have a unique situation in my life where I'm saying like, God, are you going to show up? God, what are you going to do? Just like we read from a psalm uh, a couple weeks ago that David had said like, are you, going to, are you going to embarrass me, God? Are you going to let me down? Are you going to let my enemies exult over me, God? And then he reminds himself, David does in that psalm where he says, of course not. Those who are faithful and those who wait on the Lord will never be let down. And so if you're here today and you have some type of struggle, maybe it's a job, maybe it's a marriage, maybe it's finances, maybe around the Christmas time I know with people that have had the deaths of loved ones, it's, 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 it's blue, it's cloudy, it's gray, it's not exciting, it's discouraging. I want you to know that God knows you. He knows your needs. He's your deliverer. He's your redeemer. He is your salvation. And you must fix your eyes upon Him and trust that He is going to guide you. And so you find Zechariah blown away that God has fulfilled what he said. Verses 70 through 73 was a promise by the prophets to show mercy, promised to our fathers, guaranteed by the oath of Abraham. And so Zechariah goes back and reviews his Old Testament, and he says, like, everything that God had promised to the guys who were before us, he's not doing it. Like, and I'm, and I'm getting to see it, like, walked out. Here's some application for you. God is not doing what he, had pro what he had promised. The prophets saw it coming. They just didn't know exactly when it would happen. Zechariah is telling us something very crucial, and I don't want you to miss this. God has visited the world in the person of Jesus Christ, and nothing else will ever be the same ever again. Here's my third point for you. Christ's coming gives us purpose. Verses 74 and 75, Zechariah speaks of the total transformation Jesus will make in the lives of those who follow him. So I'm going to read that for you. That we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him in all of our days. And so this delivering is this salvation and this 
Uh, holiness and righteousness is the sanctification of, as the believer, you're to be walking out this faith walk, which then renders this heart of service to the king. And so you have a purpose for your faith walk beyond warming the pew in a church. It's to say, I recognize God has saved me. I'm, I'm walking this thing out. This is, this, is, this is what's walking you out. You're walking the Word out. You're applying the Word. You're, you're interacting with the body. The church exists to worship God. The church exists to nurture and disciple the believer. And the church exists to evangelize and share the Word of God to lost, hurting, and broken people. That's why we're here. And so everything about your faith walk should be in service to the King Part of service to the king is this local expression of the body, right? We gather in this building, and part of that's your service. But then the rest of your service, I think, is this daily walking out everywhere you go, every interaction, every person. Do they see Jesus in you? Like, are you uh, a magnet for Christianity, or do people go, oh, that's the church that I don't want to go to because those people are the nasty people? And so... He saved you so that you might fulfill the highest calling in the universe, serving God without fear, in righteousness, and in holiness forever. And so we are here to serve God as He is sanctifying us in our faith walk, preparing us for this second coming. Now I have a fourth point for you. Christ's coming will be prepared by John. So Zechariah has figured out enough in all of this to say that my son, this little baby, is going to play some part in this coming Messiah. And this is a significant moment. Verses 76 and 77, he sings joyfully to John and utters three specific predictions about John's future. He will be a prophet of God, he will prepare the way for the Lord, and he will preach forgiveness. And what happened in John 1.29 when John, saw, when John the Baptist saw Jesus, he cried out, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Here's my fifth point for you. Christ's coming brings blessings. Christ's coming brings blessing. And in the ESV, it uses the word blessing, I think, 112 times in the New Testament. Not a single one of them have anything to do with money. And so financial blessings, I think, Yes, you can be blessed in a way that's a financial reward for you, but the Bible doesn't tie blessings to financial resources. And so you can't intermix the two. So in one final burst of praise, Zechariah speaks forth, the sunshine shall visit us from on high. That's verse 78. This refers to a, a new day, a, a fresh start. And this is why I tell you, I don't get very far from my own saving faith on a daily basis basis because the greatest blessing and gift of all what I should be praising God for every moment of every day is my salvation like and that God has saved me and that God has redeemed me and that I have an eternal home to go to in the presence of God and that is the greatest blessing of all life right it has nothing to do with resources. And this refers to a, a new day, a, a fresh start. The sunshine shall visit us from on high. Above all, it speaks of this hope to the hurting. Anybody here hurting? Who need a little hope. To give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death. That's if you're lost. If you're lost, you're sitting in darkness. You're blind, right? You can't see, right? And you're sitting in the shadow of death if you're lost. That's the, those who are separated from God because if you're with God, you are a new man. You're given the Holy Spirit as your guarantee, Paul tells us, until you stand in glory with Christ. And so we are all, before Christ, we're sitting in this darkness of our sin, waiting for death to devour us. And Zechariah is announcing there's a pardoning coming for all those who were condemned to die. And it will be this Savior. And my son John is going to pave the way for this coming Messiah. So instead of waiting for this death to devour you, you have a pardoning. And he says in verse 79, guidance to those who have lost their way. So you have this guide, this, this lighting your way, showing you the way to peace. And so if you're here today and you are looking for uh, Peace, because I can tell you the life of a Christian 
is one of peace, not turmoil, not infighting, not conflict, not constant drama. Did I describe anyone's life in here? If I did, I didn't do it on purpose, but I know a lot of times we have all these things going on, and I can tell you, Christian, the Holy Spirit's not guiding you in all of that. You're, you're, you're living in the flesh, and what God has for you is this shining light, which is this new day, this fresh start. He's guiding you away from and out of this darkness, is what Zechariah's words mean. Did you notice that there are only two verses in this entire song that have to do with Zechariah's own son? So this, this prophetic word that Zechariah gives wasn't all about, man, my boy's going to be awesome. He's going to be the second to Jesus. Like, life's going to be good for us, right? We're going to be rich. We've arrived. Everything's going to be given to us. That's not what he said. You see, John the Baptist wasn't focused on being first. He was focused on being second. He is quoted in John 3.30, He must become greater, I must become less. You see, he prepared people for Jesus' first coming. And we, as extensions of John the Baptist, should be putting ourselves in a place to be, as we're becoming less, he's becoming greater. As people see us, they don't see us, they see him. It's not about us. It's not about our acknowledgement. It's not about the things that we get. But we live in a culture where everything is about, I said last week, King me which is the opposite of what you're hearing in these words from this beautiful Benedictus, this beautiful song that you're hearing Zechariah sing. And so you, Christian, me, Christian, we need to be doing what John did. He paved the way for the Messiah, right? And so we need to be placing ourselves in a position where God can use us to help other people get ready for the second coming. Because just like you see, Zechariah is blown away in amazement that God delivered and answered on everything he said he would do, right? He has fulfilled, he has come through, and, and prophets had spoken year after year. They knew something was coming, they knew it was going to happen, they didn't know when. We're, we're, we're living now in the same period of going, something's going to happen. It has to. When? I don't really know but what I want to do is I want to be ready. And like John's job was to pave the way for the people to be ready for the Savior. Your jobs, my job, is to be paving the way for ourselves and other people to get ready for this second coming. I have a, a closing illustration for you. Salvation is not a human invention but a divine visitation. It is not something we achieve by going to God, but something God has done by coming to us in Christ. Would you notice something about Zechariah in this story? He didn't get his voice back until he did what? Until he acted in faith. Until he wrote out his son's name is when he got his voice back. In a similar way, we won't be saved until we write out the Son's name. Have you written out the Son's name? Have you written, Jesus' name is the Lord of my life. I follow Jesus. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to pursue God. I'm trying to see uh, how this season, this Advent season, this Christmas time has nothing to do about the commercialization of our culture. It has everything to do with what God has spoken over a couple thousand years. And we get to be a part of that. And we are in this unique time in human history. You know there's no plan B. There's only plan A. And you all are a part of plan A. Whether you see it that way or not, you are a part of God's plan for human history right now. Thank you.